now to a riveting memoir that takes a deep dive into what it was like growing up in a Chinese immigrant family in New York City during the 1970s. CUNY TV correspondent Ernabel DeMillo sat down with Alvin Eng, author of Our Laundry, Our Town. Alvin, it is so nice to finally meet you. I know we run around the same circles, but this is actually the first time we've met in person. Well, likewise, I can't believe that too, but it's a, what an honor to be on the show. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. So, Alvin Eng, you are a performer, you're a musician, you are an artist, you are an author, and now you've written a memoir. Did I forget anything? I know you are like a renaissance man. I call myself an, an acoustic punk raconteur. Oh, awesome. yes, you can't forget that. Um, and you now have a new memoir, Our Laundry, Our Town, My Chinese American Life from Flushing to the Downtown Stage and Beyond. What a mouthful and what a memoir, what a memoir. So what inspired you to finally put all of this to paper, your story about your life? Oh, you sure? Like, well, I, I'd been performing for many years, so I feel like, you know, I come from a rock and roll background, even like a punk rock background, and uh, I guess you could say in the short term, uh, after years and years of touring, it was time to make an album. You know, I feel like I, I've always done all these performances, but now I wanted to do a, a, a more permanent record of that. Because I have to say, it is a very intimate portrait of your family. It's uh, brutally honest, and you grew up in a laundry. Yes. Uh, business, right? Uh, and you, you worked there, mm. you slept there. What was that like growing up? Oh, it was it was a it was it was a very it was a very different world. Because also, in addition to being in a laundry, growing up in the 1970s in New York City, uh, every every day I'd go home not just to a, a family that was rooted in a different culture, but because my parents had an arranged marriage, it was like going back to a household that was rooted in a different century. So it was bizarre because you know. In 1970s New York City, all the rules were being broken, all the norms were being turned on its head, but yet I was going home to this really old-fashioned household, so it was very bizarre. So your babysitter at one point, right, the television. I think many children of immigrants, yes. the, te the TV really was our babysitter. And I remember when I was growing up, I actually changed my name to Christy because there was a actress named Chrissy McNichol. Sure. She starred in, I think it was called Family of the Show, and I actually changed my name because, you know, I have a very Filipino name. It's Ernaval, it's very Filipino. But you're also named after a TV character, and who is that? It's Alvin and the Chipmunks. <laughs> My brother Herman, it would make great symmetry to say he was named after Herman Munster, but actually he was named after that Herman uh, cartoon character. But because of uh, the older siblings, I'm the youngest of five, and Herman is number four, so siblings one through three named him on kind of a joke. Like uh, they were saying, ah, he looks like that cartoon character Herman. Let's name him Herman, ha ha. But my mother, who, 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 did, who did not speak English, heard it and liked it phonetically. She's like, oh, Herman, Herman, what Jungi, ho, I like it. And uh, they said, no, we were just kidding. So I guess um, equal time for him, he, they let him name me, and thankfully his favorite TV show was Alvin and the Chipmunks, and not like Leave it to Beaver or Captain Kangaroo, so I was very happy to be with Alvin. So television is where you found yourself. I mean, yes. it's kind of hard to imagine now, right, with all the Asian representation on TV, but back then, we had Bruce Lee and also... Right, the TV Kung. show Kung Fu. <laughs> you, you could say it's the opposite of, uh, instead of must-see TV, like growing up Chinese, I was called, I was called it no-see TV. There were, there were no Chinese on television, so it was like no-see TV. But uh, yes, of course now we know, of course as a seven-year-old, you don't realize how problematic it was that, that David Carradine was playing was this... Uh, <laughs> yes, was, was playing this, this martial arts Kung Fu master, but uh, I couldn't quite grasp the full picture, as, as most seven-year-olds don't. But still, just to see this, uh, this Chinese hero on TV was uh, astounding to me. I was like, oh my God, I'd never seen anything like it. So your book is also a history book. It's a history lesson. And you talk about the Chinese Exclusion Act. Mm -hmm. How did that impact, you know, your family, the Chinese Exclusion Act, which we don't even think about as impacting a family in the 70s, but it did. I feel like in writing a memoir, you really want to hopefully uh, See where your, your personal narrative, your family narrative ties in with the, the larger narrative of our times. And uh, growing up, you know, Chinese American, Asian American, when we did, the Chinese Exclusion Act was the first and God help us the last American law that made it illegal for one race of people to become citizens here. And on so many levels, it impacted my family. Just to, even the name of our laundry was the, the Fu Jai Chin Chinese Hand Laundry. But yeah, we're, we're an Ang family. That was my, uh, 
my father's paper name, how he got into the country. And just, we, we, thought, we thought it was just more of a cultural thing. There was a, a, lot of, a lot of Chinese, probably Filipinos too, like, a, like the, why are we so shy? Why do, we, why do we only socialize with people in our circle? And then you realize that's not a cultural thing. It was a, a legal thing, like a, growing up under the guise, if you will, or the cloud of the Chinese Exclusion Act, they had to live this uh, under the radar existence. They only socialized in safe circles. Well, my parents are very insular. They, they, they never went to a PTA meeting, never did anything in the block. And it's like, what? I guess we'd say, like, what's up with that? So, uh, so that, that was a huge way that the Chinese Exclusion Act really impacted our family, just the, the way we socialized and saw the world. Did you realize that now as you're um, you know, watching the news and what you have written about the past, thinking that that was the past, that it's coming back again, some of that racism and discrimination? Tragically, it's so true. It, it, it really is. It, we thought that sort of, uh, in some ways it's even worse, because at least when I was growing up, people would open the laundry door and scream all sorts of epithets, like Chinky Cho, go home, and you know, no Tiki, no shirty, Charlie, can you speak English? But uh, as awful as that was, those were just uh, verbal attacks. Now it's obviously going to these, you know, these tragic physical attacks and beatings. And, but I think the flip side of that is that we always, um, we always love the great Leonard, I can't believe we're still saying the late great Leonard Cohen. He always said, Two things: there's fine wine in every generation, and there's a there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. So even though we are the Asian community is, in some ways, has never been more under siege than it is now. Um, I think the other side of that is I think in many other ways the Asian American voice, the community has never been stronger. Like just from the perspective of theater, like in the 21-22 season, there have been over like 10 Asian American theater productions. So I think there's a lot of uh, we are fighting back not just on the streets, not just standing up for ourselves, but also standing up through literature, through the arts, and really, I think telling our stories and really giving us ourselves uh, the role models that we did not have when we were growing up. Just, I think that, that is a, the best combat for all the anti-Asian hate happening now. You know, speaking of, of your mom and dad, mm -hmm. you're quite honest in your memoir. You know, they had a very volatile relationship. Yes. And you write about your father hitting your mother and also your mother disappearing, you know, for stretches of a time. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that sort of informed you as a little boy and also as an adult now? Sure. Um, what I guess when, you, when you're very young and, and you see your, you know, your parents fighting, mainly with that, that led me to always seek alternative worlds. And that I get, first led me to drawing pictures and ultimately led to me writing. And just, uh, just I could not deal with that, that violence. And then when my mother would disappear, I've been thinking about that and, and writing about it. And it, I guess when you, all of a sudden your mother's out of the picture and, and that's the primal reaction was it made you think of mortality way too young for a young kid. You think, oh my God, my, my mother's gone. Is she ever going to come back? And I, you know, I already felt so different. And every customer that came through the laundry door, they, and uh, they had what I thought were like regular American names. And, uh, and it just ingrained in me even more how different our family was. My father died when I was very young, when I was 14, so that made me have a very different relationship with my mother, just seeing what she went through with my dad and then her being a single mom in my teen years. So it really made me see things very differently, just, just, just in those ways. Do you think that's also what led you maybe to get into punk rock as a way to rebel? Because Asian and punk rock really don't go together. <laughs> right, at least, at least that back then yeah. it didn't. So I guess finally after really trying my whole life at that point like to cover my otherness and all of a sudden in the punk rock community I said, no, we are gonna, we are not, we are gonna feature our otherness. We're gonna scream our otherness, our outsiderness to the rooftop. So it became, oh my God, this is a great place you do that. Oh, you know, I did want to ask this one question that you write in the book. When you were you know, working in your family's laundry business and you were packing, all the clean laundry, you would look at the packages and sometimes wish that you were going to those yes. families' homes. Yes, I made an analogy. As a, as a little kid, it, they, even, even the way all those brown packages wrapped up with all the colored tickets, they even looked like a big building. So I imagine that each colored ticket was a, almost like a window into an apartment of a different family. I said, oh, I wish I could go to that family. I wish I could go to this family as, as my parents would be fighting or whatever. When things were bad, I wish I could go. I wish I could slip into one of those packages and go to different, a different place, yes. Has your, I know your mom and dad have, are past. Um, did your, have your brothers and sisters read the book? They finally did, yes. He came. And, their, and what was their reaction to the book? Oh, they all, I was actually a little relieved. I wasn't, I, because you know we all go through the same things, but we have completely different interpretations of them. But they they all loved it. They all read it in, in one day when they got it. And some of them were not really readers too. So thankfully, the, uh, all all of my siblings have read it, and there's been no pushback. They've they've really loved it. So, 
So what do you hope readers mm -hmm. get out of your book? I think that really just to take a direct action through the arts or through the streets, either way it works. Like, like the activism on the, on the streets and the activism through the arts. Just something really making your voice heard. I think that's the greatest message we can find, like making your voice heard in a way that you want it to be. That's this, I think that's the strongest takeaway message that someone could take away from this book. Thank you so much, Alvin, for talking to us. This was such a great interview. Again, your memoir, Our Laundry, Our Town. Read it. But it was so great to meet you and to talk to you about the book. Well, likewise, thank you so much for having me. You did a great close read of the book, so it was an honor to be here. Thank you.